I'd like to thank first the uh, Sanamuk First Nation for allowing us to be here on their territory today. I'd also like to thank uh, my colleagues and, uh, and students and uh, everyone else that uh, that's, uh, have given up their time to be here today. And finally, I'd like to thank the colloquium organizers, Helen and Ka Katerina. Uh, Helen, as she said, was, uh, well, she didn't say this, but might have implied it, that she was instrument instrumental in, uh, in kind of uh, getting me to, to be interested in history. Uh, I blamed her for that, though, in other public venues, so I think I'll just let that go. Um, so I'd like to start, I guess, by explaining my interest in, uh, in at least the first part of what I want to talk about today. As an undergraduate student, I took a, a course in quantitative methods, and uh, I'm actually not entirely sure why, but um, one of the things, the assignments we had to do was to try to find a, a body of historical numerical data and to try to make some sense of it or to try to analyze it. So what I wanted to do is try to tie that into other coursework which I, I was doing. And I think that's kind of what students are known to do a fair bit of. So I, I kind of focused on the Department of Indian Affairs annual reports for uh, the 19th and uh, early 20th century. And before I began thinking about what the data might mean, I was struck by the, 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 the level of detail and the kind of material that was being collected in the, what they call the tabular statements, where, which were the numerical, numerical uh, collection of data. Things like uh, the 14 types of grain, roots, and fodder planted and harvested, the quantity of 17 distinct types of livestock and poultry kept, 18 varieties of agricultural implements, 19 classes of buildings, and the sources and values of income uh, for all indigenous communities across the country. So, and, and a myriad of other uh, data that, that was important to them. I don't know if you can see this very clearly or not, but one of the things they measured was the number who wore civilized clothing. And I just, and all of this was, was, was gathered and, 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 and quantified and compared to with, uh, with indigenous communities with their neighbors. I can't think about another group in Canada uh, over the entire course of Canada's history where there was that level of observation and surveillance of of uh, people for their entire course of their lives and over such a long period of time. The categoriz categorization of, of indigenous people by non-indigenous indices, by determining, for example, what clothing was civilized, uh, and then identifying those who wear it in the annual reports and published in the annual reports, helped to emphasize this, these uh, uh, illusionary and inaccurate images of, uh, uh, that, that served to maintain and fortify an understanding of those, of those Canada defined as Indians, as economically, politically, socially, and culturally inferior and, and in need of reform. The long-term objective of all of this uh, was, for, the, for Canada and the DIA, the Department of Indian Affairs, was to uh, assimilate Indigenous peoples into Canada's economic and, uh, and political structures. So the goal of the annual reports then, the published annual reports, was to show their progress that they were making in, in getting to there. You know, showing that they were making progress in, in the, their civilizing project. The salient point here, I think, is that the, the annual reports and the information displayed in them had nothing necessarily to do with the well-being of indigenous communities or even indigenous lifeways, uh, but it's the only thing being measured is the relative success of the DIA's uh, assimilative project or the projects related to assimilation. Uh, this is a, a fairly famous image. It's, it was um, uh, appeared in the, the annual reports for 1904 of Thomas Moore, a student at the Regina Industrial School. And they're meant to be kind of a before and after uh, set, and to uh, to to show the success of both residential schools and the uh, and the department's efforts as a whole. And there's a number of things going on here. I mean, you can see that the two images themselves of the boy, how now he's wearing civilized clothes, I guess, uh, but also it's kind of less, maybe less, or more subtle, and I'm not an art historian or anything like that, but I think these, the, the non-personal images are important as well. So we've got this fur here, or a pelt, and over here we have a potted plant. You know, so it shows the, a civilization even in that way by showing cultivation and all of those kinds of things. And actually this image shows up in, uh, in a big book on residential schools by J.R. Miller, and he cuts it here which I think is a big problem. 
but the way that the, the way that the original image even is displayed has been cut in some works to uh, to take away from the I think the significance of the of their meaning. The annual reports identified in, individuals and groups then that were adhering to state policies that were showing this progress towards uh, towards assimilation, and uh, and singled out those who weren't for remedial action. And not as consequentially, they also managed to identify the quantity of land that was unused and unneeded, and so then could be uh, removed from um, removed from reserved communities. And of course, that's subject to a particular understanding of use and need. The strategy of including the tabular statements in the uh, in the annual reports at around the turn of the century produced the further benefit of increasing the image of the, the scientific legitimacy, I think, of the, uh, the DIA itself, the compilers, uh, and all of that, uh, and, and the rational understanding of the way the world worked, just by, just by putting tables into the, into the uh, reports. And they're, they're loaded with them. If you want later, I've got some, uh, some photocopies here of just the areas that I looked at, uh, the, the interior of British Columbia and southern Alberta. But if you want to have a look at the kind of data and the level of data, it's, uh, it's here for you to look at it too. But the, this, this presentation of the work, their annual reports as both scientific and efficient and rational, uh, served to, to benefit the DIA as well, or the Department of Indian Affairs as well. But from an indigenous perspective, it's little more than a kind of an aboriginal science fiction, I would argue. Uh, this image has really nothing to do with my presentation, but I really cool. like the title of it, yeah. <laughs> aboriginal science fiction, but I can tell you that's about it later. But it's, um, but it's kind of an, a, a, an interesting notion, I thought, that you know, for, for them, for indigenous peoples, this is just, it is, it's a fiction, right? Because it's just a, it's a construction of data. The categories themselves are constructions about what the, uh, what Canada was actually interested in. So, self-serve. And again, it doesn't have anything to do with community well-being or indigenous life ways in any way at all. The reports did, though, help to promote the project, the DIA's own project of assimilation and their massive surveillance network that spread across the country uh, that it's meant to, uh, to ensure compliance to, uh, to, their, to their will. Um, the expense of maintaining this, this uh, juggernaut of a bureaucracy, surveillance bureaucracy, was always an issue for opposing politicians and other surveyors, other observers. So while some of us today might, for example, imagine an indigenous population that has always been dependent on the goodwill uh, of the state, to the extent that that's ever been possible, I think that that's a relatively recent development, a relatively recent phenomenon. In 19, or 1895, for example, uh, David Mills, who was the, had been uh, Minister of the Interior, uh, it was also the Superintendent General of Indian Affairs, so the, the Cabinet Minister responsible for Indian Affairs, wrote this. In British, and, and said this in the House of Commons, rather. In British Columbia, out of 1,029,000 1, that have been appropriated under the pretense of helping the Indians, there has been expended on officials 695 plus thousand. So, just with this one instrument here, I think you can see that, that the money that's being spent, so-called, on Indians, is actually going to the bureaucracy. And I think there's there's some um, there's some interesting uh, uh, modern day uh, parallels to this. The, the residential schools uh, funding act that came out, survivors that the survivors got is also a significant amount of that went towards towards the uh, the bureaucracy and to to maintaining it. So this surveillance network created a body of knowledge about indigenous peoples that didn't represent any universal reality, I don't think, but served to normalize power relations between, between the state and, uh, and indigenous peoples. And it also mitigated against, I think, the, uh, any other way of knowing indigenous people. So this is presented scientifically as fact. And, uh, and it was really difficult to, to see, from, from a non-indigenous perspective, to see indigenous people in any other way. Before moving on to kind of more modern images, uh, I just want to tell a brief story from the World War I period that I think outlines the impact and power of the image, image of the Indian, that was constructed by Canada's uh, surveillance and reformatory network in the early part of the 20th century. So even though uh, Indigenous soldiers paid the same price, 
uh, faced the same risks as non-Native veterans in World War I. They weren't treated nearly in the same way on their return. George McLean, for example, and I don't have an image of him, but these images are from the battalion that he was part of, the 52nd Battalion. Uh, he was an Okanagan from the, the head of the lake reserve on Okanagan Lake. He served with the Canadian Mounted Rifles during the South African War at the turn of the century. Today, one of the platoons in the in DND, the Department of National Defense's Bold Eagle program, which purports to be a unique summer program that combines military training along with Aboriginal cultural and customs, is named after George McLean. So we have McLean um, platoon. In 1916, October of 1916, uh, he left his children with friends uh, at the head of the lake reserve, head of Okanagan Lake, with instructions that they be sent to the Kamloops Indian Residential School uh, as soon as there was room for him. McLean then enlisted again, and by December he found himself in France with the Canadian Expeditionary Corps, or CEF, the 52nd Battalion. In April of 1917, during the Battle of Vimy Ridge, he launched a daring solo attack, solo attack on a group of enemies, soldiers. His attack was apparently effective, and he was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal, uh, and his, his citation describes his efforts. Single-handed, he captured 19 prisoners, and later, when attacked by five more prisoners who attempted to reach a machine gun, he was able, although wounded, to dispose of them unaided, thus saving a large number of casualties. So this guy's a, a hero. I don't know how you can say it any other way. Um, his efforts were recognized as well by the Department of Indian Affairs in their annual reports. Unfortunately, as this citation says, he was wounded during this attack. He was sent back to Canada for medical treatment at a convalescent home at uh, Qualicum Beach. And uh, a year later, he was back in the interior working for the Douglas Lake Cattle Company and he made his decision to put up a house. He requested that money that had been uh, remaining from money that was assigned from his soldiers pay to go to his children's care. So he, didn't, he wasn't able to, uh, to, to send the money himself. It was actually garnishing from his wages to look after his children as a soldier. Um, so he requested that this money be, be sent to him, any money that was left be sent to him from his military earnings uh, so while the total to his credit was $775, the department secretary, the Department of Indian Affairs secretary, sent $200 not to McLean, but to the DIA inspector in the area, and uh, claimed there was, and I quote, no means of knowing how much this man requires. So this is his money, remember. Uh, to, term, to determine, as he put it, and I quote again, the most desirable disposition of the funds in hand, the inspector, uh, approached the manager of the Douglas Lake Cattle Company. Again, not the soldier himself, the ex-soldier himself. Soon, McLean requested more money. He gave an accounting of it, uh, how it would be spent, and asked that any balance be invested in a victory bond. So the DIA sent a check, the Department of Indian Affairs sent a check and the bond to the inspector of them, and said, and I quote, you should warn him, McLean, to place it in self-keeping, in safekeeping. It seems likely that the department decided to release the money at all because of McLean's decision to volunteer for military service in the first place, his heroic efforts at Vimy Ridge, his request that his children be sent to residential school, his ability, despite his injuries, to hold a steady job with a large established company, his responsible accounting of how the money would be spent, and his patriotic request that the balance be, be, uh, be put into a victory bond. But even after all of this, even after experiencing the horrors of World War I and fulfilling the DIA's criteria for advancement in every way possible, he, there was still a, a feeling, apparently at least, within the Department of Indian Affairs that he might hold on to some lingering Indianness that needed to be eradicated before he could possibly be allowed to have the money that he's owed. And I guess the point is that, uh, is that the methods by which Euro-Canadians came to know Indigenous peoples uh, through the surveying eye of the, the Department of Indian Affairs and other commentators, actually maintained an already established inferior status, uh, regardless of all evidence to the contrary. And I just want to point out some things about this graphic. I don't know, can you read it? Is it too small? I don't know. Uh, but it's, from our eyes, it's uh, fairly racist. But, uh, you know, it says, pale face, my skin is dark, but my heart is white. For I also give to Canadian patriotic. So, you know, trying to, trying to 
solicit First Nations for funding and then using this as a way to do it seems a little bizarre.